As a little boy, I just remember just quite distinctly that uh, sitting in that cinema, watching the films, but particularly Star Wars, and I just remembered I wanted to be a part of that. To make your break into the industry, it's very much a cliche, but it's just all about doing stuff. You just got to go out because it's all about practice. It's all about being able to show people that you can do things. And it's just so much easier than it was in my day. So my advice would be to practice and just to approach approach editors and approach production managers and approach post-production supervisors and just get your name out there and tell the universe that this is what you want to do. As a little boy, um, I uh, am old enough to have um, been around and grown up with the original Star Wars films. So I just remember just quite distinctly that that uh, sitting in that cinema, watching the films and films like that, you know, those, the, the, those sort of really big brassy films, but particularly Star Wars, um, sitting in a darkened cinema and seeing what picture and sound and music uh, can do in a darkened room to a to a an amassed audience, and I just remembered I wanted to be a part of that. I, then that was a little as a little boy, I jumped straight over the want to be a rock star phase and want to be an astronaut phase and want to be a fireman phase, and just went straight to something to do with filmmaking. Um, I was always really heavily into storytelling. I loved writing stories at school and as a youngster, um, and I just thought that this what what. what what is achievable to an audience is just phenomenal and I want to be a part of that. So that was my focus always. Um, but as, as I say, I guess the pipe dream was always to be sort of a director or a writer or, or something like that. So I left school, um, straight out of school, I went to these film schools. Uh, one was the Australian Film School uh, and then another one was more, more of a technical college where they taught more practical um, applications of filmmaking. So I went, I applied for that and I got in uh, and the way that was structured was it was uh, one year full time uh, and uh, then you went away for a year to get some work experience and then you'd come back for, for two years part time. So I got in straight out of school and uh, the first six months of that first year was focused on everything. You got to get to try cinematography, you got to try um, sound, and you got to try editing, uh, and of course everything else, everything else involved in the filmmaking process. And then in this, in the second half of the year, uh, you focused on editing, uh, which I chose. I chose the editing strand because that was um, that was always said to be the, the 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 more immediate stepping stone to to directing. And so I did that, and uh, for the second half of the year, and just fell in love with it. I absolutely loved the control that you had over the storytelling process uh, in the editing room. And I'd finished up my first year and went out and got a, was lucky enough to get a job on a mini series straight out of technical college. The Sydney film industry at the time, I, I was very very um, it was all about timing for me. I have to be honest because. Uh, right, right then, Sydney was going through this boom of of a lot of big films were coming to Sydney. But they, they were either Australian films or American films being shot here, because right then was the time of the first Babe film and the second Babe film for that matter. Alex Perez's Dark City, Moulin Rouge was being made here. The the Star Wars sequels were being made here. Matrix was being made here. So there was just this big sort of explosion of of cool stuff going on. So that was timing. That was lucky timing number one. Lucky timing number two was it was also right at the time where um, uh, film, actual working with film, was giving way to working on nonlinear and working on AVIDs and computers and so on. Why was so much production happening in Sydney? A lot of those films that I mentioned were made by Australians, um, you know, Babe and... Uh, uh, Dark City and Moulin Rouge, obviously. Um, and the other reason was I think that they, were, they just introduced a whole bunch of rebates and incentives for, for, for shows to come down. And it was cheap, <laughs> let's, let's face it. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, so the, uh, at the time I was trained as a film assistant actually working on film, um, but at the time it was giving way to, to nonlinear editing. Um, and for, for, the, for about sort of five or six or seven years, on those big films, they would have a, an avid assistant 
and a film department because they would keep a running con for me. Because back in the day, the resolution of, of nonlinear wasn't good enough to have big screenings and things like that. So if you want to have, an, if you want to have a screening for the director or a screening for an audience, you had to have a film print. So there was always a running film department going. So I would always head up that while my very dear friend, Jace Ballantyne, um, would often be the, uh, the avid assistant. So we kind of worked together and we, we became a bit of a team and, um, and we would go from one of those productions to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, Mission Impossible 2 was another one that was shot in Sydney. I never take for granted, Nick, how fortunate I was for the timing that I that I came through the ranks, you know, because it was very there's just some great stuff going on and some great people to work with, and so it, so I was just hooked and I loved the I loved the process and I loved the the um, the the editing room, um, and then I remember I was doing I was helping out a friend on Happy Feet, the first Happy Feet film, a production manager on a film that I had worked on, she was now producing a really low budget film in Sydney. And she said, do you want to, would you like to cut it? And of course, you're always looking out for that first break um, to go from the, from assisting to, to editing. Literally the day I started that film, there was another knock at the door uh, by another uh, <laughs> by another producer that I'd worked with a couple of times who wanted to introduce me to the Spearig Brothers. And they were about to make um, uh, Daybreakers. And we met uh, and immediately hit it off and we've become, we've been the best of friends ever since. Um, you know, real film nerds like I was, and we just met for lunch and really got on really well. Um, and so, yeah, they offered me the job on Daybreakers, which thankfully wasn't starting for a number of months. So I was able to finish out that first film and, uh, and, and move on to Daybreakers. And, and then it just sort of moved on from there. That's great. Um, at what point did you meet uh, Boz Lerman? And, and was Australia the first film that you worked on with him? By that stage, I'd already met Baz here because I'd worked on Moulin Rouge. Um, uh, so the, the very, I distinctly remember the very first day I met Baz was at a production meeting, a big heads of department production meeting, which I obviously wasn't the head of a department at that stage, but we were, the editorial crew were invited into the room. And uh, it was just sort of like a, a run through the script and every head of, head of department had the opportunity to ask a question about what the what the idea of the scene was. And Bay sat at the head of the table and that was my first time I'd ever laid eyes on the guy. Uh, and from that day, I saw him, uh, what I've come to know and love about him. Uh, he just commanded the room with, with, uh, with information and his vision in his head and he's always got a million ideas running around and, um, and he just... Uh, 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 imparted all the, all of the the vision in his head to the, the heads of department at the table, and that was my first meeting. So that was that was nineteen ninety eight, I guess, the end of eighty eight, the beginning of ninety nine. Okay, Moulin Rouge. I was uh, a VFX. Oh, well, I started off as I mentioned as the film the film assistant, and then they needed a visual effects editor, so I moved into that role. Uh, and then on Australia, I was in brought on as an additional editor. Um, and then on Gatsby, I was the editor or one of the editors. And then on Elvis, same. So, that, yeah. That's great. Uh, and, and at what point did you meet uh, Jonathan Redmond? And how did you start collaborating closely with him? On Moulin Rouge as well. Jono came on as an assistant editor on Moulin Rouge. We both met each other and met Baz on, on Moulin Rouge. We both kind of started with Baz at the same time in just in different capacities. And did you have synergy right away? Did you say, oh, I really like working with this guy? What made you think that, or what made you know that you would continue collaborating? On Moulin Rouge, we probably weren't working t together because we were in different departments. And then in Australia, uh, he had been around for a while because he did a lot of the the um, the pitch reels and things for the studio, um, and then continued doing sort of EPK material and things throughout the film while I was uh, in this in this additional editor role. So we sort of we again we were we weren't working next to each other, but we were certainly within each other's orbit. But he John is a lovely guy, and he always was, and um, and he's a real a real wonderful presence to have um, around. And yeah, so I've, yeah, we've been friends for, so that's over 20 years ago now. So I've known him for a long time. In an interview, you said that working on uh, films with uh, Boz Lerman, there are, there's a sense of, uh, well, the music department, the composers working right next door sometimes, the, uh, the other, the sound editor maybe is working 
down the hall from you. There's a sense of things just sort of being invented as you go in this like dynamic, like real time shifting uh, energy was the impression I got from that interview. How, what is post-production on, on a Baz Luhrmann film like? Post-production, Nick, is a blast and it, it's basically just continuation of production. Um, it, I, I often say these days there really is no pre-production production and post-production anymore because it, it's all kind of, it all sort of happens all at the same time, but even particularly more so on a Baz Luhrmann film because for Baz, um, music is as big a part of the storytelling process as everything, everything else. Uh, so it is graphics and VFX and transitions and all that sort of stuff. So his dream was always to have everybody together so that he could go from one room, one, one department to another department and really take what he learnt from, you know, say the editing room and take it into the music guys and say, you know, next door we're doing this. Let's try to let's try oh, to match like that. The music. So that's always been Baz's dream from the from the get go. And on Elvis we really achieved it because we were in a building up on the Gold Coast, which is in Queensland and other, another state of Australia. And we'd purpose fitted out this this standalone building, uh, which is actually a former police station, would you believe? Um, and we'd fitted it out with, uh, with a theatre, uh, like a big, beautiful theatre, um, which Baz's partner, uh, Catherine Martin, the production designer, had you know decorated with Elvis's the the furnishings from the sets and that kind of thing. So it was really really sort of felt like the environment. And we had a theater and we had um, editorial was there and music was literally next door. The music department, a super a composer Elliot Wheeler and um, music editor Jamison Shaw, was, he was right next door to me. Down the hall was the visual effects department. Upstairs was the art department. It was such an organic process and a real alchemy um came out of it because you know baz would work on some some of those mashups of music with the music guys and they'd give it to us and we'd 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 sort of have that along with the cut and then we'd adjust the cut to it and then we'd get it back go back to them and um and it just became and so too with the art department and the visual hex department it just became a real organic way of working and um and it was wonderful it was really the best way of working because everyone knew what everyone else was doing and um and you could feed each other off each other's um you know the, the collaboration was just great oh that must have been fun and and originally you had a very long cut for about four and a half hours is that right that's right original assembly which we called uh the kitchen sink because it had everything in it including the kitchen sink um uh it was four hours and 20 minutes 20 plus minutes wow. uh and that was essentially just uh the assembly that Jono and i had done um but baz invited a lot of the heads of department in to to watch it at four hours 20 minutes and we had a big screening in the in the theater and it really played and, and people walked out and they were visibly moved by this cut at four hours 20 minutes which buoyed us no end because it meant that we had really great clay to work from and we now just had to bring it down to a theatrically releasable length um but it was it was good it was it was a good starting point how hard was it to trim that down uh, i read that you removed some of the early scenes between elvis and his band uh and then yeah and then maybe trimmed some of the actual performances is that right yeah that's right so the focus of this story is the relationship between elvis and colonel tom parker um and so anything that sort of stepped outside that by too much bigger margin just had to go. And there were some wonderful performances. As you mentioned, there were some, some beautiful scenes with his early band, um, a beautiful scene with his first girlfriend, Dixie. It just wasn't sort of driving the story and keeping it on point with Elvis meeting up with Tom Parker. So those are the sorts of things that had to go. And similarly, as you mentioned, every performance in the film was shot and cut as a full performance it, it's the full length of the song um and they were great they were just awesome um but i just meant it was too long you know and so they always had to sort of start to, to, to carve things down a bit do you think that that cut will ever be released the kitchen sink edit it probably won't come out as as the cut that we presented but um but you know who knows in time it might be a you know like a, it could it could very easily be broken up into kind of a you know a four or six part 
limited series oh, because um, <laughs> yeah i mean who knows who knows what's uh but but um but there's certainly plenty of material to do that for sure there were a lot of really amazing transitions throughout that film where uh were you're sort of accelerating the storyline there's a lapse in time typically where we jump to another you know we're covering uh, elvis's almost his entire life in the course of these of this film and those transitions are so cinematic were though did baz shoot them uh that way or was that something you discovered in post how do we get bring in all these different elements to get the camera uh into this next scene of his life it was a bit of a combination of the two there's some of them were planned for example uh you know the you know that whole sort of what we call the the hayride weave which is that bit in the film where we're seeing the young elvis in the pentecostal tent having watched the the dancers in this in the shake and and the girls start grabbing for him yeah Yes, that's right. Yeah. All that was um, planned. It was always planned to jump from young Elvis to older Elvis in the back alley of the hayride and then walking on stage. And so that was always planned that way. And the music guys had always prepared that weave and that sort of thing. The scene on the Ferris wheel when they, when they, when Tom Parker and Elvis meet and we sort of, we whip off to the signing of the contract and to the breaking up of the girlfriend. Right. All that was planned for. Um, but then there were many that weren't. The scene where Elvis is walking down daytime Beale Street and we're intercutting that with him arriving home um, outside his housing project home. Um, they, those two scenes existed as full scenes in very different parts of the film. Um, but just in that, as you say, it was in, in that sort of needing to bring the film the link down you just found those devices to to concertina the things together, but never just randomly. Like we always we always had justification and you know narrative idea behind it. For example, that Beale Street scene. The idea was that Elvis kind of inhabited these two places, but belonged to neither of them. He didn't really belong on Beale Street, but nor did he believe belong in this um in this housing project. Oh, that's cool. The uh, the breakup scene exists as a big long scene, and so too does that there in his when during his decline, um, the, when he's in bed with that that groupie and he shoots out the TVs and all that sort of stuff. That that was all one big long scene. But it just and they were great scenes and beautifully performed by Austin and wonderfully shot. But just we just had to sort of keep check on ourselves of how long we were spending at any given time and and that decline the the, the decline of elvis the, you know his career and so on was probably the, the thing that we went back to the most one thing you mentioned uh in another interview was that uh tom hanks and, and tell me if i misunderstood this gave that you know his his many different versions of colonel parker uh in mm. different scenes so that you had the freedom if i understood this correctly you had the freedom uh in the edit bay to sort of shape who he was or, or what that narrative was how accurate yeah i mean it's probably more just a result of tom hanks's extraordinary than anything else that he just was always giving options because you know oh, that's so cool. it, tom parker loved elvis there's no question he was as gobsmacked by elvis's talent as, as everybody else but he just saw that of manipulating it to, to make some money and stuff but but how much of that was you know evil intent or how much it was just like he was looking after both of them um that was always the sort of the the, the fine line that we were treading um and yeah tom hanks is tom hanks and there's a reason he's tom hanks <laughs> um and that is because he is extraordinary and he always gave us that little you know the, the choice between a slightly evil eye or a mis mischievous eye those little glances, those little looks that he gave us, he gave us plenty of choice. How many takes does does Baz typically shoot? Is it like a David Finch that'll go thirty or forty or sixty takes, or is it typically? No, no, he 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 shoots a lot. He he covers a lot. He covers a lot. But um, as far as take numbers, I mean, he yeah, no, certainly not that. I mean, it's never crazy. He he might get up to sort of ten ten because he he often um, Baz Baz is very much an actor's director. Um, and so he'll he'll go and he, he does a lot of rehearsals be before before shooting, but he also finds the scene as he's shooting it. So the first few the first few takes, you know, might be he's still kind of finding finding the rhythm and that sort of thing. So by the time you get to take, you know, eight or nine or ten, yeah, you're, you're there. 
So let's say you're looking at 10 takes of, of Tom Hanks giving this performance. Will you see, oh, okay, he's playing like a really evil version of Colonel Parker in this take. And then the next one, okay, he's, he's definitely playing much lighter, more... Uh... It's probably not quite as cut and dry as that. You're, okay. you're probably sort of more, he'll probably give you a, a bit of everything in okay. everything. <laughs> um, so you just got to go and pick out the bits and pieces. But, oh, um, but yeah, it was, ne- it was never, okay, and now we're going to do the evil take and okay, okay. But, okay. but what he did what he often did um and you could hear it kind of you know off camera was he would it would he would go to bears and say I, I can do one more i've got something else i want to show you and then he just oh that's that's cool and, that's fun yeah so it's a, so it's very much a collaboration and bears is bears is with both actors and his crew a very collaborative guy he's clearly got his vision and the and the beauty of working with him for so long is you know what that vision you know you don't know uh, detail by detail but you know what sort of things he'll be going for so so but he's very collaborative with us and he's very collaborative with his actors and you can hear that on set like he's he's open for all sorts of experimentation on set oh that's great and and you did get both uh in the in the scripting phase is that right very early on in production of elvis I personally, because uh, I was on another, another show, um, so uh, so that did Jono did a little bit more of that. Oh, did a lot more of that stuff because he um, once again came on to to produce uh, sizzle reels and and pitch reels to the studio. Um, uh, to, to you know, Bears really likes to sort of spend some time working out if this is if this whole thing is something that he's that's going to be worth five years of his time. So he does these very, very comprehensive um, sizzle reels. That uh, and so, so yes, yeah, so but that, that was more Jono on, on this film. Okay, how does that process work? So let's so let's say Baz says, "All right, uh, I'm ready." You know, I I know what my next film is going to be. At what are these sizzle reels? What is he pitching to studios? How does it go from an idea in his head to a script to an approved production? What are those things? It was a script, but he, he sort of comes up with more of like a, a scriptment of this is kind of, this is what in broad strokes what this film is going to be um, or what, what I'd like it to be from a style point of view because he never he never wanted to ever just make the straight up biopic that, you know, this guy was born, this is what happened and then he died sort of thing. Um, so... It's for, for Baz, for something to maintain Baz's interest for the five years or whatever it's going to be to, to make the movie, oh, okay. um, it, it, it has to be something that, that he's engaged in and that he he knows that he can he can put a different slant on it. So he'll, there, there's a, scri- a, a, a scriptment, as they call it. Um, and then, yeah, then he just, uh, um, a John O would come on and uh, just get a whole, because there's so much footage in existence of Elvis Presley, um they and the music guys were um also around quite early so they were starting all their kind of musical mashups and and their their modern takes on Elvis's music um and uh and they just produced these these very comprehensive um pitch reels I guess which is just a combination of of um of Elvis footage sometimes they bring in the actors uh, because there's a whole bunch of you know rehearsal footage and stuff that they were doing at the same time, so they they get some actual some actual footage of of Austin, you know, not not looking like Elvis at all, but just so they've been some storyboards, some animatics, just anything and everything goes, just to sort of put together this, so they can present to the studio and say this is the type of film that I'm going to make. So he's already chosen the cast that he wants. They're already on board. They've read this scriptment. And, and everyone, you know, the whole creative team wants this to happen. And then you're taking that, that pitch reel, uh, a, basically a, a short film that, that you guys have made. Mm. Are you shopping it to different studios? So you're, you're trying to get someone to, to green light a hundred million plus production at, at that stage. Is that right? Yeah, no, it was always Warner Brothers. Well, Warner Brothers was sort of on board from, from the same from the time. Um, I probably jumped the gun a little bit uh, in in this particular instance with the cast. The, the casting was very much undecided, so so there, there would have been there would have been more straight up Elvis footage um, in and and storyboards and 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 you know, artwork and stuff like that. Just and but, but but mainly in this instance, music music was the big was the big thing of you know this is the type of 
thing because Bez, you know, as you know, Bez always likes to have his modern takes on on music. We did it in Gatsby um, as well, and and uh, Romeo and Juliet and so on. So yeah. And so uh, at that point, is there any chance that Warner Brothers will say no, or is it pretty much guaranteed? You know, Baz knows what he wants to do, and and he's been a you know a surefire hit over and over again. So so it's that is that more of a formality that presentation to Warner Brothers? I think Warner Brothers was always on board, but it's more it's really is more of Baz working out what Baz wants to do. He'll say, "This is what I want to make. It's going to be a mashup of all sort of different types of different, you know, de- handlings of the music, and it's going to be it's we're going to jump back and forth in time like this. Um, it's, so it's it's basically a, a a template for the film that he wants to make. To to answer your question more directly, Warner's was always on board, but this was just Baz's way of working out what he wanted to do. You know? I'm very curious what you do on a movie like Lego Batman uh, or Happy Feet. So in a in an animation, uh, how how is a feature editor involved? The difference between um, people often say, what's the difference between cutting animation and cutting live action? Uh, and then in the middle, there's also the the hybrid the hybrid version of animation with live action. Um, and it's it goes like this: on live action, you've got to make it work whatever whatever they give you you have to make it work and that's a challenge in itself with animation you start with nothing and you've got to make it work so the challenge there is you've it's it's infinitely more free because you've often you've got a a real say over can 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 you give me a wide shot here can you give me a close-up here um so it, it sort of tests a whole different sort of part of your storytelling metal if you will but it is a challenge because you start with nothing there's, and there's there's always kind of a script of, of of some description but a lot of animation and I don't know to be honest Nick I don't know why this is I don't know why the animation world kind of seceded from the usual convention of write a script and then just go and do it but yeah. <clears throat> it just it just doesn't work that way that's, that's why animations take so long because they are they're often written in the cutting room so I'll um, as the editor, you'll you'll sit in the edit bay, and you'll be putting all this what what might start off as storyboards first. Um, to you put them all together, you'll be doing the voices yourself, or with other, some of the other people in the cutting room, just to just to t- get the timing right. And you'll just oh wow. Um, and then you'll just write this stuff on Lego Batman. Myself and Dave Burrows, the other editor. There was times where we were spending more time on final draft than at the other because we were the director would say, you know, we, we've got to work out a way to get from A to C a story point. And so we just sort of sit and just write it. Obviously the our dialogue and that kind of thing was gonna be was gonna be fixed by proper writers later. But it's just a way of vibing out how the story is going to go and then the storyboard artists would go and would sort of mock that up and you'd put that together and the and jokes might work and jokes might not work story points might work and story points might not work so you just do it it's, it's a it's a real it's a real it's real fun like i love it um uh because you just you sort of kind of make it up as you go along it's it sounds fun it's i mean and it sounds like you're directing it how where, where is the line drawn between the director and and you who's there changing shots changing sequences writing dialogue it sounds like writing uh acts that needs to happen yeah um yeah well, the director i mean the director is obviously the the person who is the arbiter of what's in and what's out and it depends on what sort of director you're working with how collaborative he is but but he obviously has, still has the final say but again he's just asking for ideas and he in the case of lego batman um chris mckay uh, spent a lot of time down in Australia with us, but also spent a lot of time in LA. So we were, we were communicating um, every day. And he's a wonderful, he too is a wonderful um, a kind of uh, collaborative force. And he would say, you know, he'd ring up and say, guys, we need to we need to work out a, a way to get us from this point to this point. Here's some ideas. Like he, he'd always be the ideas guy. But the finer detail would be left to us. And you always read about that and hear about that in the Pixar story room where everyone like no there's no such thing as a bad idea just throw it in there and see if we see if it works and but it, that's not to make it sound as kind of chaotic as that like there is there is a a, a goal like it's not just a free-for-all but it is a lot more fluid in in the, the production of the materials that goes into making the film okay so if i understand this you have your you 
get a script, uh, you receive storyboards, and your mm -hmm. job is to create an animatic at that yeah. point. Right. Okay. But you're also working with that storyboard artist to create chain shots uh, or change yeah. uh, sequences or, or maybe add details that, that need to be shown in this animatic. Mm -hmm. Then that animatic is locked, animation begins, and you're finished. Is that right? Uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You, it's the evolution continues because what happens then is, um, you know, a storyboard artist might say, um, you know, Batman's going to run across the screen in this amount of time. So you allow for you allow for that in three boards to get him across the screen. But then the animation begins, and the animators have him running a lot faster. So, so you have to sort of take the animation. So you're basically cutting the film numerous times because you cut it once to the rhythm of the storyboards. Then you start getting um, initial. Um, layouts or, or what they call layout or, you know, an, an animatic looking shot. Uh, and so the timing will change. So you've got to cut that. You, know, you might be find that you need more time or less time. And all this is done in collaboration with the animators. So you say, guys, that's too quick. Can you slow him down or can you speed him up? So, and then of course, when, when the um, finesse animation starts, timing can change again. And that's when, that's when you start to switch back to a more conventional, eye for editing like you because they the details in their face so you want to stay on someone's face for a bit longer to get the emotion out of it and that kind of thing so yeah you really are cutting the film the same thing three or four times with each iteration and then of course with something like um peter abbott 2 which is a hybrid of live action and animation there's a, a, a little bit more of a challenge there because you're kind of locked into what the the human actors are doing um, but you can manipulate the animation around them. So you can sort of, you can, you know, hold on shots a bit longer than maybe you would because there's, you just got to keep in mind that there is going to be some, another non-existent yeah. character doing something. And so at that, at certain stages in that process, you'll have a cut that's maybe half animation or let's say two thirds animation and a third just storyboards of things that have yet to be animated. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. And you'll constantly test those. You'll took, you'll always test those cuts, um, and yeah, it's a, a, bit, a bit of imagination involved in because you are jumping from storyboards to to storyboards to rough animation to sometimes completed animation. So you get, get all manner of mediums in there. Oh, how interesting! And when you say you're testing them, who are you uh, screening it for? And are you screening the whole that whole hybrid feature? Yeah, to ourselves or to, to bring in some some friends and family, which is always amazing because. I remember working on Guardians of Garhul, which I'm not sure if you saw. That was in the Owl animated Owl movie. It was with uh, that very famous director, uh, who I'm blanking on. Uh, Zack Snyder. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that was great. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic guy. But the, I remember we had a screening of that, and there was literally whole sequences in that where there was all storyboards, and they were just owls talking. One owl talking to another owl. <laughs> Um, and they're kind of all kind of the same um, in storyboard form, um, cool. but the audiences the audiences could follow what was going yeah. on. So it was um, never never underestimated an audience to to know to be able to sort of absorb whatever you put in front of them in the interest of telling a story. They, they will catch on. They'll understand. They, well, they really will. Yeah. Uh, how many times will you watch? Uh, a feature film so for example with elvis trying to cut it when you had to cut it down from four and a half hours down to let's say around two and a half hours how many times did you watch each different iteration by the time you were done with that process you'd also have times where you just watch maybe just watch the first act or just watch the third act um but uh in its entirety i'd say we probably watched it you know 30 40 times amazing so, wow now <laughs> how do you uh edit a film like peter rabbit to where you have, you know, so many of these scenes are taking place between characters, CG characters in live action footage that have not yet been animated. Well, on Peter Rabbit 2, we had a really great, um, a really great system where they would go out and shoot the actors live on location or on set. Um, and then they would have these guys walking around with little just cutouts of rabbits who okay. would sort of walk, walk them around. And also another basically a second unit, we call them the plate unit, where if there was a shot that didn't involve any humans, this other crew would come in and, and sort of 
shoot the just the just just the straight plates of, of so just say you and I were talking, and then the rabbits were listening in for the for all the shots that you were cutting down to the rabbits um, only point of view. That would be the plate unit which would go and come in to the same set after the actors had gone and shoot all the plates and things required. And so there's these guys that would walk around with little cardboard cutouts of rabbits to sort of stand in the they were to kind of to size and so on. I see. Um, and they would, sh- they would shoot a plate with those cardboard cutters and then shoot the same plate without them. And then what we did, which was really clever, was the storyboard guys would then just do storyboards um, to be overlaid over the live action footage, which was much, much quicker than doing sort of um, even the most rudimentary animation pass which would allow, again, there's that just for me to get the timing right. So there was, there'd be, you know, if, if the actors walked away and the rabbits followed them, there'd be these little storyboard rabbits following them just to sort of get the idea, just to fill the frame to see how long you kind of needed on the, on a shot. Okay. Um, and then similar to the animation process, you'd hand that over uh, and the animators would get to work. And again, the timing might change because the way I'd, anticipated this these little storyboard guys to move it might be different from what the animation guys um suggest yeah. so so once again you you it's it's very fluid you're sort of changing timings as you go but it, but, but as you say you, you are a little bit more locked in to the fact that the actor the actor walks at a particular speed and so on and so you're editing all the way through that final final animation because you have to be there tweaking timing as the animation that's right, and you can also, you know, because it's an, for the animated animated part of things, you can be changing. Uh, Will Gluck, the director of of um, Peter Rabbit one and two, is fantastic at just coming up with gags at the last minute and changing jokes at the last minute. So because you've got that freedom to put whatever you want into the mouth yeah. of the animated character, and then I mean, I can't tell you how many times James Corden came back to record new jokes, and all the all the characters kind of came back to record new jokes. So all that, it's all, it, yeah, it remains very, very, very fluid. So how do you edit a, a film like At Last? Which is, do you speak Mandarin? Uh, did you have a translator there? Wow, Nick, you've, you've done your research. Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious about, about this one. It was a real adventure for me because I don't speak a word of, um, of Mandarin and, and the director doesn't speak a word of English. So, wow. um, yeah, so we did. We had a translator called Lisa. Um, she was absolutely to say... She was an essential part of the cutting of that film. We'd be an understatement. And what she did was um, she went through and, and subtitled all of the dailies for me so that I didn't have a clue what anyone was saying. Um, so whenever I got dailies delivered, which was slowed the process down just a, a little bit because um, the, before I got the dailies, she had to go and subtitle them. But because of the any other language, you know, that you're, that you're not familiar with, you know, sometimes they flip words around and do all sorts of things i would have to i do it and and edit based on literally simply what i'm reading on the bottom of the screen but i would always have to call lease in to say have i clipped a word like you know you know just say i wanted to um to pre-lap a word into this shot before or whatever have i Done that because because all I'm reading is this big long sentence on the bottom of the screen, but I don't know exactly which word is what. <laughs> so so I did often have to call Lisa in and show her uh, my um, edit and say, have I have I sort of um, you know clipped anything or have I, have I missed a word or 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 even even the is the flow correct? Because one of the most challenging things in that film was not so much. Um, what was being said but how it was being said because you know the delivery of the and this would be true of any language um uh you know in mandarin those two lead the two lead actors they might be saying you know i love you dear but they'd be delivering it just their their tone is really kind of harsh yeah. similar to yeah you know, i can imagine them cutting a you know, a German film, you'd think everyone was just screaming at each other all the time. <laughs> um, but, but they're not, but they're, they're, they're being very loving. So I did have to often call Lise in and say, have I, does, does the, the cadence and the emotion of what they're saying flow, you know? I'm sure that was uh, really hard, the intonation. Maybe sometimes they would s- stumble over a word as, as actors do naturally. And you would yeah. know. 
Yeah, so, I would have a clue. That's right. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. Okay. But then, and then, and then, when the director was in the room, in the room, which wasn't he, he worked. We worked a lot apart. He was, um, he was very hands off. But when he was in the room, Lisa had to be there because if she, if she had to go to the bathroom, the director and I would just be like <laughs> smiling at each other. <laughs> it was part of the reason uh, Yue chose to work with you on that film because it's set uh, in Sydney, and and you know Sydney, or, or what? What drove that decision versus working with a. Uh, uh, Chinese editor that where there wouldn't be that language barrier. He, um, the director UA, he was very keen to make it a Western style film. Um, because, yeah, uh, because it was it was set in Australia. So um, yeah, it was it was kind of from the get go. The producer rang me um, and said, "Would you like to do this film?" Because they they want oh, cool. because it was a it was an um, Australian uh, cinematographer. There was an Australian set designer. It was in a, it, all, all the crew was Australian except for the oh, cast and the director. <laughs> so it was quite unique, and I and I really I really admired Yue for doing that. Like he he wanted to make this Western film, a uh, Chinese film, but in the Western style. So yeah. Uh, what was it like working with Russell Crowe? Uh, and and how challenging is it working with an actor director who's both responsible for the story, but also probably he doesn't want to have awkward or, or unflattering shots of himself. I, I would imagine. I know I keep starting every sentence with, he was a wonderful guy, <laughs> but genuinely, <laughs> genuinely, I, um, I've just been fortunate to work with really wonderful people. And Russell is yeah. one of them. He's got a bit of a sort of a, there's, there's a, there's a perception of Russell that, um, that, that um, a lot of people have that he's you know a bit of hard work and a bit of a grump and whatever but i saw nothing of that the the guy that i saw because it was his first film so he was he was very inviting of of that collaboration he obviously has learnt from the best um with, with the directors he's worked with over the years and he came he came to his first directorial film very experienced yeah, I, we have to say he was extraordinary but he was really collaborative and a really lovely guy and a very generous guy. Um, and we got on really well. And it was always about the movie. Uh, in fact, to be honest, he was harsher on getting other things right because it was a period piece. You know, he'd see somebody's medal on his lapel was in the wrong oh, spot probably. or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, because I was really going into it, I was really interested in, in your very same question of how, how can you, how can you, uh, take a step back and and treat yourself as a character rather than rather than yourself, um, and um, and there's times where he sort of you know he knew that he performed badly or whatever, um, so we wanted to cut away from that. But he was he was never any more protective of himself than than anyone else in the for the film's sake. Mm. But the, the most amazing thing was watching him on set. Like he would have this extraordinary ability to to just walk from behind the camera to in front of the camera and you could see oh, everything cool. flip around in his mind of you know he'd say guys we want to move that flower pot to the left kind of thing and then he walks straight on set and know that he had moved it to the right you know like he, he, he was able to immediately flip from from what he was seeing behind the camera to what he was needing to do in front of the camera it was extraordinary oh. it was a real privilege to see yeah were you seeing this in the footage in the dailies or were you there on set some of those shoot days? No, I spent a little bit of time on set um, They because they shot in Sydney where I was cutting, but then they went on location. So was, there's was a lot of time where I wasn't on set. But um, How often will you go to set on, on films you work on? To be totally honest, as little as possible. Um, only because, uh, and it, well, for a start, there's always so much to do that you sort of don't have while you're on set, you're not cutting kind of thing. Um but also, I mean, so oftentimes you get called down to to have an opinion on whether something will cut or not. But I do. What I love about the cutting room is that you've it's so removed from from how something was shot. So you are you are completely devoid of information on how long they spent shooting something, how much something cost to shoot, how much resource went into a shot. So that you've you're completely removed and and. And you can say that shot doesn't work for the movie. I'm going to ditch it out without having this knowledge of. But I know how right. hard everyone worked for that you shot. Know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I always I, I enjoy visiting set when I can. Like it's a buzz, but only as a only as a visitor. You know, uh, there have been films, for example, on um, 
Gatsby, Great Gatsby, where I was cutting on set because Baz oh, does really? like, yeah, had this um this tent in the corner or out of the back of a truck. Oh, like, that's fun. Yeah, so you and oftentimes they, you would be getting the video split footage to cut just to make sure everything's working. The video split footage on set when when they're shooting a scene, there's a there's a a, um, a video operated recording it just so they can play things. Oh, back. you're actually getting the feed as they're shooting. Yeah, or you're yeah, seeing yeah. it. Oh no way! Oh, that's so fun. So that was that was an experience. It was uh, it was a bit, a bit grueling. I've got to be honest. <laughs> I'm sitting in this uh, sitting you know in a dusty old tent rather than the comfort of the cutting room. <laughs> what was the uh, reason for having you there on set for Gatsby? Uh, uh, Baz just likes to sort of see if things are working kind of straight away rather than having to, and then the cutting room was like a, a ways away. So, um, yeah, it, it, it just provides an immediacy of, of proving that something's working and, and, uh, he can sort of see things cut together straight away. But, um, these days, uh, the video split operators are so good at doing that as well that they can sort of test shots together. Are you cutting in Avid? What What do you think is the, uh, for editors who are you know, aspire for a career like yours, what software should should they be mastering? I am an Avid guy. Um, that's what I know the the best and use all the time. I have the uh, the Happy Feet films were cut on, on uh, Final Cut, so I have used Final Cut. Um, I'm about to do a job uh, in Adobe, which I've never used before, so that'll be that'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, so that'll be a little bit of a learning curve, but, um, but, uh, you know, Avid is my tool of choice and I'm just, and, and, and st it's still the kind of the industry standard. Uh, I know, um, uh, a premiere, Adobe premiere is, is making big moves because everything talks to each other in the process. You know, the, the, the files all talk to the grading systems and the VFX systems and that sort of thing. So why are you doing this upcoming job on Adobe and, and who, who makes that decision? There I'm coming in just as a, to have a pass at it. So it's, there's an existing cut that's been cut already okay. on an existing system. So I'm just going to, I see, I see. Yeah. I do believe that, that I'll probably, the, the time will probably come where I have to use it as from, from the beginning anyway. So, so I kind of welcome the, the excuse to learn it. Yeah. So is that sort of, would you call that like an, I know that there are script doctors, are there, I, I guess you're an, you're an edit doctor in, on this project. Well, how often will you come into a project that's been cut to do a, a polish or to try some variation on it? Uh, it does happen. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I haven't done it very often, um, but uh, it certainly happens where, you know, the, the producer or, or the, it's often, uh, oftentimes, not exclusively, but oftentimes there might be a case where, you know, the producer has a view and the director has a view and so they just want to try and they'll bring someone someone else so so the main editor can keep on the job of finishing the film they they might they might want to try a different version of something so rather than take up the editor's time they'll get someone else just to come in and and and, and give something a try and so what's the duration of that for you is that a week or two weeks or how long when you're doing that that variation this job that i'm literally on next week is only three days um but um but but yeah, but it can be, um, it can be a couple of weeks, you know, um, and, and it's happened. I've been on the flip side of it where, uh, you know, you'd have, um, someone come in where I'd be the editor and, and they'd want to try something and, you know, you, you just have to have no ego about it, you know, if, if, uh, because oftentimes it's, it's, um, if, if it, if trying a different version of, of the, the film helps the film, then I'm totally up for it. Um, um, but yeah, but, but, but it's a good, it's good to not have to deviate from the actual work to go and try this other thing that may or may not work out, you know? So what, what is the fastest you've ever had to cut something? What, what's the greatest time pressure you've ever been under? Probably that first film that I mentioned that the very first film, which is a film called the final winter, um, just cause it was so low budget that they just didn't have much time to, to spend money on, on gear and stuff. So it was a six week shoot, a five week shoot. And then I think it was still 10 weeks in the cutting room. So, so it was, it was still a healthy amount of time. But yeah. What is the more, what's a more common uh, timeline for post-production on a feature? It uh, varies very dependent on the size and the scope of the film. Elvis, we we're on Elvis for 18 months or over 18 months, um, wow. in, in, in total. Um, I was on Lego Batman for two years. Um, wow. Could you do other projects in between or was that pretty, were you, did you have to be exclusively focused? Yeah. 
No, because you you are in there every day. Like it's yeah. It's, wow. It's, yeah, it's not um, it's not That's a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a time. There's a period of my life where I was working for years and years, but sort of only walked away with a couple of credits because they're all so long. I remember their Babe films are long. Uh, anything that's kind of VFX heavy or or intricate is generally takes takes a while. Yeah. A final question is what what advice do you have for for people who dream of having a career like yours? How do people become an assistant editor for for someone like you or or work their way up you know up the ladder of, of the post team uh and what are the things that you look for when you're building that that support team your assistant editors second assistant editors yeah great question um i know it sounds very cliche nick but really you know to 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 get in to make your break into the into the industry it's a very it's very much a cliche but it's just all about doing stuff. You just got to go out. It's so easy these days to to shoot your own stuff on a phone, or to you, everyone's got a friend who wants to make a music video or something like that. Um, it just whatever opportunity you can get to edit, just edit because it's all about practice, um, and it's all about being able to show people that you can do things. And it's just so easy, much easier than it was in my day to when I was starting out to just go and do stuff on a phone or and you can everyone's got a everyone has got a an editing suite on their phone practically but if not definitely on, a, on their laptops um yeah. so it's so easy just to sort of practice and 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 just just do stuff and and uh and and sort of hone your craft and then from that point forward um you know just sort of approach approach productions and approach editors i've had lots of people He'll just sort of reach out out of the blue and say, "Do you have anything?" And, and oftentimes, I've got the people that I already work with, but I'll keep those people in mind if a if a runner's position comes up or if a PA's position comes up, and then they sort of get in the door. and And once you get to know people, if they fit, if they're a good fit, then you don't want to let them go. So my advice would be to practice and just to approach approach editors and approach production managers and approach uh, post production supervisors and just get your name out there and and tell the universe that this is what you want to do um and the universe will, will, will often respond and as far as putting together a team um i'm all about uh you know you spend so much of your life with these people at work sometimes more time than than you spend with your own family so i really look for someone who is a is a great fit on a sort of personality point of view um, and then who are keen, you know, they, they, they're someone who sort of wants to be there. By far the assisting crew is the absolute machine of any film these days, even more so than it used to be because they're so relied on and depended on to and called upon to, um, to service so many different departments on so many different levels of technology. Um, right. That to find a good one is it's, uh, who fits, who fits into the, into the sort of the, the 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 vibe of the cutting room is is just wonderful and there's so many of them out there and they're yeah they're all they're all keen um it's just it's just to find those guys um and and hold on to them until they want to make the break you got to support their their desire to break and become an editor editor under themselves but at the same time you don't want to let them go because they're because right. right. they're so good yeah yeah i get that cool well, Matt, this was excellent. Thank you for a great, great uh, Q and A. So interesting, so much great wisdom in there. So many great stories. Really appreciate it. Ah, oh, Nick, thank you so much. It was an absolute privilege to talk to you. I hope we can do so again. What What is the next one we can look forward to? Uh, a little romantic comedy um, uh, for an English romantic comedy uh, called And Misses, which um, which is uh, I'm not sure when it'll be released, but um, that's what I'm about to start on um, in a couple of weeks. Cool. And if people want to uh, engage with you more, where can they find you online? Do you are you on social media? I have social media existence, but I don't really um, engage that much. But uh, but they're more than welcome to contact me. I've got a website, uh, mattvilla.com.au, and uh, there's a there's a contact page there, and they're more than welcome to get in touch anytime. mattvilla.com.au. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate it.